Yes, Goldie, please open the PPT here. Yeah. You can see your screen. Yeah, you can make it a full screen. Yes, okay. Right. Um, so, uh, I, I, can I start? Sorry, I think we will have one hour of lecture and then again we will come back on, a, on another day. Okay. Yeah. So, go to the next slide. Yeah. Go, go to the next slide. Yeah. So, with the uh, advent of. Uh, okay. So, let us say what is machine learning? Machine learning is the ability of the computers to learn from data and identify patterns that are normally hidden by complexity. So machine learning derives its uh, strengths from different fields of science and engineering, which includes information theory, computer science, artificial intelligence, statistics, physics, neurosciences, etc. Next slide, yeah. Next, yeah. Right. So, um, Right. So, so given a set of DNA sequences, is it possible to identify? So machine learning makes it possible by using different algorithms. Go to the next slide. Yeah. Right. Given a set of protein sequences, can can we identify sequences which have which are allergenic and sequences which are not allergy causing. It's again possible to employ machine learning algorithms given a large set of sequences from which you can identify different functionalities. Yeah, next slide, yeah. Next, yeah, right. So machine learning works on the principles of given a set of sequences input DNA sequences. Machine learning employs different algorithms, both simple and rigorous, learns from the data, then builds a model and predicts. From the prediction, it again is able to improve prediction by the knowledge it derives. Yeah, next. Yeah, there are different types of machine learning which are supervised, which learns functionality from both input and output data. It has, it knows both the input data as well as the output labels. So I'll come back to this a little later. Whereas unsupervised learning derives a structure from input data alone. Reinforcement learning learns from experience. Supervised learning learns from data and reinforcement learning learns from experience. In this uh, lecture, we'll mostly um, restrict to only supervised learning. Yeah, there are so there are different algorithms for supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, for supervised learning, it includes uh, k nearest neighbor, random forest decision tree, support vector machines, logistic regression, etc. For unsupervised learning, uh, which includes dimensional reduction, employing uh, various clustering methodologies and the principal component analysis, and also data visualization. Also, we can employ unsupervised learning methodologies which includes the PCA and uh, different visualization techniques. Yeah. So reinforcement learning is a different paradigm and uh, we'll not uh, uh, go into the details of it now. Go to the next one. Yeah. Go to the next one. Yeah. So the general pipeline is to given a set of uh, sequences, structures, omic data, images, biomedical signals, expression profiles, etc. We employ some pre-processing methodologies uh, to remove outliers, missing data, etc. Then we make a split of train and test data. We build the model with the training data, and the built model is used uh, with the test examples to test the validity and improve. Yeah. Next, yeah. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. Yeah. So when would we use machine learning? When patterns exist in our data, even if we don't know what they are, 
and we cannot pin down the functional relationships mathematically. For example, in Ohm's law, we know we know the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance in terms of a formula. So if we cannot have a formula directly, so we'll use this sort of machine learning methodologies where we have only data. What it means is for bioinformatics, we know from sequences, we can derive functionalities. From structures, we can derive functionalities. With why we use data for that? It, because we do not know the, in, the intricate interactions between different atoms and the molecules inside. And we cannot have a functionalities for this because the number of interactions are too many. So it's a many body problem as in physics they say. Because of that, it is difficult to get a functional relationship between various interactions. That's the reason we use data in the form of simple attributes and like, like sequences. We derive attributes from sequences and structures and then and use that to identify functionalities. Yeah. Next. Yeah. So there are different learning methodologies. This is just a simple uh, picture of uh, multi different learning methodologies, which include uh, the typical neural network and uh, support vector machines, etc. So let us explain what is classification. Given the size of tumor and the rate of spreading from uh, for to identify whether the tumor is malignant or non-malignant. You can see the the color code shows the black color, the people with the, the with, with this black color points are are having malignant cancer and those with the light blue color point do not have malignant. So we just are uh, plotted the size of the tumor to the rate of spreading. And then now the algorithm here is a simple line, the line which separates the data into two different classes. So the yellow is a new data. So the blue and the, and the dark blue and light blue are the data for which we have experimental evidence that these are malignant or non-malignant tumor. So when we use this data to build a model, here is a simple line. We can use the size of tumor and the rate of spreading for the new person and then see where it is falling. If it is falling below the line, then it is uh, non-malignant. If it falls above the line, it's malignant. So this is a classification. This is a supervised classification methodology. I'll come back to it in a little more detail in, in a few slides. In clustering, what we have is we only have the input data. We do not know the class labels. We don't know whether the persons are they having malignant or uh, uh, non-malignant cancer. So we employ only the input data and we cluster them into different groups. By clustering the data into different groups, we can get structure out of the data. We can get information. That's clustering. In regression, so in classification, we can classify data into different groups, like enzymes can be classified into different classes. Uh, um, you can classify data into multiple types of uh, uh, antimicrobial peptides, which is antibacterial, antiviral, and anti-cancer peptides. So our peptides do not have these act activities. So we have class labels, so we can group them into different classes, class one, class two, class three, class four. That is classification. In regression, we have the our output as a, uh, continuous variable, like quantitative structure active relationships. Given a set of molecules, we can extract descriptors and from experimental uh, determination, we also know their activities in like IC50, we know the values. So if we plot one descriptor versus activity, we can given for a 
if you have for certain number of molecules the ic50 values known from experimental measurements so we can plot descriptor versus activity so if it falls in a line then it's it can be linearly regressible so this is regression so in regression we have the output as a continuous variable like ic50 values in classification we have classes we group the examples into different classes yeah to the next slide please yeah so for example in gene expression profiles we have uh, a leukemia data we have which is uh, very famous data in uci we have 4000 expression profiles for 72 people and we need to identify whether the persons uh, are having uh, leukemia or not yeah next yeah this is a classification yeah next now we will come to little more clearly what is supervised and unsupervised learning in biology they can you so you can use them to identify gene functions protein functions disease prediction etc next yeah yeah so let us see to employ machine learning algorithms in any domain we need to provide domain information for example if we are trying to identify given a set of sequences dna sequences whether they whether they code for proteins or whether they are gene coding uh, sequences or not let us give you a simple methodology how to ex extract domain attributes now the dna sequences have four different nucleotides the simplest way of providing domain information is to extract the frequencies of uh, the different nucleotides so that we can have four different frequencies adenine number of adenines in this uh, dna sequence is six so total number of uh, nucleotides are 20 so the adenine frequency is 0.3 so like that go to the next slide yeah go to the next slide yeah so like that you can get the frequencies of uh, different nucleotides and then you can use this as attributes as domain attributes in the machine learning algorithms next slide yeah okay so let us see how do we use this to differentiate between essential and non essential genes certain genes are essential uh, genes which have housekeeping and more uh, important uh, functions certain genes are not essential genes so identification of essential genes is a very important task how do we use machine learning to do this we will show that with this simple example to the next uh, slide please yeah so from this set of 10 uh, given sequences uh, uh, genes we extract the different uh, nucleotide frequencies and then tabulate them now in so we also know certain in in some cases from experimental annotation the first five genes are essential that's why we labeled as one and the next five genes are not essential so that's why we labeled as zero so if we have experimental annotation then we can have labels right come to the next slide yeah so let us uh, try to see the simplest way of building an algorithm is to plot the frequency of uh, guanine versus frequency of adenine for the 10 different uh, genes you can see you can use a straight a line to separate the data into two different groups because we are we know from experimental annotation that certain genes are essential and certain genes are not essential we can color code them into um, uh, blue and red so having color coded and see how they have nicely separated into uh, two different classes so the algorithm here is just a simple straight line the equation of the line if you know the equation of the line then when a new gene is there you extract the guanine frequency and adenine frequency and plot 
if it falls above the line, then it's an essential gene. If it falls below the line, it's a non-essential gene. Right. Next. Right. So here it separates very nicely into two different groups. But in real life bioinformatics data sets, such 100% uh, uh, separation is not possible. Go to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In this slide, you can see the line here, the best possible line, separates the data with some errors. Some of the one non-essential gene has come into the essential group and one non-essential gene has come into the non-essential group. So out of 10, uh, out of 10 genes, eight are correctly predicted and two are not correctly predicted. So the accuracy is 80%. Come down. Yeah. So we can have different performance measures also. We'll, I'll come back to that a little later if there is time. Next, yeah. Next, yeah. Next, 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 yeah. Right. We talked about uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. Let us come back to it a little more clearly. So for the four sequences, for the first sequence, we know from experimental annotation, it's not an allergen. The second sequence, protein sequence, we know it's an allergen. Third is a non-allergen, fourth is an allergen. So that means from experimental annotation, for every sequence, we know their functionalities. If for a given set of sequences by previous experimental annotation, if we know the functionalities, then we call this is a supervised learning. So we can build supervised learning algorithms. The use of building supervised learning algorithms is to build a model from known experimentally annotated uh, genes and build a model. And that model can be employed to identify uh, new uh, sequence, new protein sequences, whether they are going to be allergen or not allergen. Yeah. Come down. Yeah. Next. If we do not have experimental annotation, it's not possible to label. So we cannot use supervised learning for that. Next. Yeah. Come down. So in unsupervised learning, provided set of input sequences, we do not have class labels. If we can extract knowledge out of it, then it's unsupervised. In supervised, we need to require class label and then build a model with the class label and we can validate it by employing unseen data. Next, yeah. Yeah, go, go to the next one, next one, yeah. Next, yeah. Right, so we only have two attributes we've uh, extracted from the sequences and then we don't have output labels. So we can use unsupervised algorithms to cluster them to different groups. You can ask the algorithm to cluster them to two groups or three groups or four groups. So only a certain number of clusters will be meaningful. So once they, we cluster them into different groups, then we must, by using methodologies, so when when five of the uh, examples have clustered into the top group and five of, uh, six of them have clustered into the bottom group, we have used some similarity measures in this unsupervised algorithm to cluster them into groups. So once we cluster them, we must ask the question, why the five examples have come together. That should be some similarity. So after clustering, we must go and inspect those sequences. Maybe experimentally you can annotate and say, indeed they are allergens. Okay, then we can see. So, so unsupervised algorithm, we, we get knowledge and structure after clustering. Whereas in supervised algorithm, we already have the class labels. Yeah, next, yeah. Next, yeah. So in the supervised algorithm, we already have the class label. So that's why we have color coded them. So 
so the the, the the algorithm here is a line so and a new sequence you extract the hydrophobicity and charge as domain attributes and then and then you just plot if it falls above the line then we call it as allergen if it falls below the line it's non allergen come down yeah come down please yeah next right this is what you have told yeah next yeah next so domain knowledge can be provided in multiple ways come down yeah yes come down yeah so for in protein function identification you can from the sequences we can provide multiple sets of domain features we can numerically represent the sequence in terms of uh, the numbers of amino acids 1 to 20 so we can number them and use that numerical sequence as uh, input to the algorithms we can extract amino acid frequencies like we extracted four nucleotide frequencies from uh, um, and, uh, this thing uh, DNA sequences, we can extract 20 amino acid frequencies and then use them as input attributes and then use an algorithm for identification of protein functions. We can extract dipeptide frequencies. There are 400 dipeptides. If there are 20 amino acids, you can have 400 dipeptides and then you can extract the 400 dipeptides and then use them as domain information. You can also extract tripeptides that are 8,000 in numbers. Like K equal to 1 is amino acid, 2 is dipeptide, 3 equal to tripeptide, 4 is 4, 5, 6, etc. You can use. And then you can use them as input attributes. You can extract the homology information in terms of BLAST and Cyblast profiles and then provide that information. You can also get remote homology using the position specific uh, scoring matrix and then give that information as input attributes you can also provide motive information you can provide secondary structure information if you know secondary structures are available for the sequences you're using then you can use that information and then i will come i will show that in a little while how do you do that you can also use multiple physicochemical properties like hydrophobicity, hydrophobicity, charge, etc. You can also employ structural attributes like surface accessibility, coordinates of atoms and contact order. Yeah, next. So next, next, we already talked about it. We can extract 20 amino acid frequencies the same way. Yeah, next, yeah. Next slide, yeah. Next, next. Yeah, we can also extract uh, A index provides uh, a large number of uh, properties. You can you can give the properties like, for example, the hydrophobicity scale. Uh, you can for every uh, amino acid there is a hydrophobicity scale value given. So you can use those values and then as input attributes. Next, yeah. Right. You can also add all the, uh, for a given sequence, you can add the grand average value and then divided by number of uh, the alphabets there and then get a grand average hydropathy value, which is known as gravy. Gravy can be given as an attribute. Yeah. Next. Yeah. Right. So you can provide uh, given, if you know the secondary section information of the uh, sequences, you can give the information this information as input attributes go to the next yeah so you can given a sequence if you can say if then amino acid is is a part of a helix or a sheet or a coil you can give so from 20 letter alphabet we now get into a three letter alphabet which is much simpler also uh, this is useful when certain ty types of binding uh, types of uh, functions, uh, yeah, yeah, certain types of secondary structure is needed. So, uh, so you can use this information 
second is second information and provide it to the algorithm as attributes. Yeah, next. So you can also provide surface accessibility using N access program. You can get the accessible surface area. You can provide this information. Next, yeah. Next, yeah. We'll go to the next one, yeah. So you can provide the uh, FISA angles as uh, in input attributes. Next, yeah. We can also reduce alphabets in terms of uh, certain uh, properties. Yeah, next. Sometimes uh, some properties can be joined together. Like uh, you can say you, you can represent positive charge, positive charge amino acids by one, negative by two, and neutral by three. So uh, you can uh, you can give a three-letter alphabet to uh, denote the attributes from the amino acids. Next, yeah. Next, next, yeah. We can also use triples, so hydrophobic positive. If uh, amino acid is hydrophobic positive or hydrophobic negative, hydrophobic uncharged, so this sort of information can be provided as attributes. Yeah, next. Next slide, yeah. Next. Now, uh, let us go to, um, if we have, if we have two attributes, then we can use a line to separate the data into two different groups. If we have three attributes, say for example, hydrophobicity, hydropathy, charge, and hydrophilicity. So how do we do that? Come down. Yeah. So for three attributes, we can use a plane which can separate the data into two different groups. If we have more than three attributes, we can have to use a hyperplane. Although the hyperplane is mathematically existing, but we cannot visualize it. Yeah, come down, yeah. If uh, certain, uh, for certain problems, they are not uh, um, separable linearly. So for this, uh, the first, uh, this thing, you have to draw two different lines to separate the data into different groups. For the second figure, you cannot use any linear classifier or a line to separate the data into two different groups. And for the third data, again, you cannot use a line. Now, in the second and third, the algorithm here is to identify the surface. The second is a crooked surface, you can see. So you must be able to identify that surface. Whereas in the third one, you have to identify the quadratic surface, which is a circle. So, so the problem now boils down to identification of the surfaces, which separates the data into different groups, which are non-linearly separable. Now, come down. Having said and done, suppose you've got 20 different attributes, you cannot even visualize the data. And if you cannot visualize the data, you, can, you cannot identify the surface. So that means identification of surface and then trying to separate the data into different groups is impossible. So we have multiple algorithms which can handle linear and nonlinear problems, which include k nearest neighbors, support vector machines, decision trees, random forests, logistic regression, and uh, classifiers which use probability like Bayesian classifiers, neural networks are inspired by the uh, interconnected network of neurons in the brain. And recently, the neural network has field has grown so much so that the neural network is now uh, multiple layers of neurons are used, which are now called deep neural networks, which are used to solve 
problems with high dimensionality and multiple uh, attributes. Yeah, next. I will give you a simple algorithm to start with. So this is known as a K-nearest neighbor algorithm. In this algorithm, based on the idea that examples which belong to the same class are same protein functionalities lie close together in the Euclidean space. So new examples can be classified depending upon the class labels of the closest training examples to a given example. Go to the next slide. Yeah. So in this k is an algorithm uh, parameter. If k equal to three for any new unannotated sequence, we identify three neighbors in the Euclidean space and see the class labels of those three neighbors. Suppose we are identifying allergens and non-allergens. If we take one new query sequence and find out three nearest neighbors, for the three nearest neighbors, if, if all the neighbors are allergens, then the query sequence is known as is uh, labeled as allergen. If two are allergens, one is non-allergen, then we again label it as allergens. If one is allergen, two are non-allergens, or if all of them are non-allergens, then we label that query sequence as non-allergen. So that means identify that k nearest neighbors and find out the majority class of the nearest neighbors and assign the majority class label or functionality to the new query protein. So this is a simple idea. I will show that in the uh, figure. Yeah, next year. Right. So uh, we have a set of sequences which have been experimentally annotated as allergens and non-allergens. That's why we can color code them by uh, drawing um, by uh, drawing a graph between hydropathy and charge of each of the sequences of the extracted uh, properties. We have a new query sequence. Assuming that the one which is the upper one, the upper left side, yellow, is a new query sequence. Let us say k equal to 3. So we have to identify the three nearest neighbors to that. If we can identify three nearest neighbors, all of them are allergens. So we, so that uh, the new sequence can be now annotated as an allergen. Similarly, for the one which is down, we, the three out of three nearest neighbors, two are non-allergens, one is allergen. So that's why we can annotate the new sequences non-allergen. Yeah, come down. So if we have more than, we, here we have shown it for two attributes. We can also show for three attributes, but we cannot show it for multiple attributes. So in those cases, we have to find out a similarity, like you can use Euclidean distance for uh, the between any given sequence to any other sequence by just uh, finding out the formula, the Euclidean distance. Suppose there are three attributes, the Euclidean distance between uh, sequence 1 and 2 is square root of x1 minus x2 square plus y1 minus y2 square plus z1 minus z2 square plus etc. Et where x1, uh, y1 and z1 are the attributes of sequence 1 and x2, y2 and z2 are the attributes of sequence 2. So this is how we can calculate the Euclidean distance. Once we calculate the distance, we find out the nearest neighbors, k nearest neighbors from the distance, and then you can identify the uh, class label of the query sequence. Yeah, next. Yeah. This is what I have told. Yeah, next. Yeah. Right. Yeah, next. Next. Yeah, I will explain this again. And we don't have time much. Yeah. So the training involves finding the optimal value of k. So how do you find the optimal value of k? 
is to use different uh, k's 1 3 5 7 and 9 etc we have to use only odd k because if you use even k there can be a clash two neighbors will be allergens two neighbors will be non allergens so there is a clash so to avoid the clash we keep the k as odd so we if the k is so we train with so we just use k equal to 1 and then find out the accuracy k equal to 3 find out the accuracy and so on whichever k gives you the best accuracy we can use that k as our algorithm uh, parameter k yeah next okay let me talk about a little bit on support vector machines so that i can show you the uh, libsvm software for that yeah so come down yeah Yes. Um, so what we have, the general approach is to, we have a set of sequences. For example, identification of allergens or non-allergens, given a set of experimentally ended sequences. For certain number of sequences, we know they are allergens. For certain number of sequences, we know they are not allergens. Given a set of sequences, we build a model a supervised learning model and use that algorithm to identify class label of a new sequence. So let us say how SVM does it. For any given algorithm, whether it's SVM or decision tree or k-nearest neighbor, there are we need to split the data into the training and test set. Normally, 70% training and 30% test or 80 tra training and 20 test, depending upon number of sequences we have. Train the model with the training set. With training the model means we you can use different algorithms. Any given also in any given algorithm, there can be multiple parameters for the algorithm. For example, k, the k nearest neighbor, what is the best k? So the training set, we identify the best algorithm and best algorithm parameters by using some performance metric, which I will come to that metric a little later. And then once you train it, the trained model will be tested with a test set. So we have to use the optimal set of parameters, which works very well, both for the training set and the test set. Yeah. Next. Yeah. So here I'm showing uh, given a set of uh, attributes. Uh, descriptors here we are going to find out whether the drug is going to be active or inactive so if we have two descriptors we can use a line to separate the data into two different groups yeah next yeah next next suppose we have three descriptors then we have to use a plane on one side of the plane active molecules uh, uh, are located and on the other side of the plane the inactive molecules uh, cluster together yeah next so in, now how, how do we select now where is hyperplane suppose we have 20 different amino acid frequencies or multiple properties as, as domain attributes so we cannot draw a line or a plane and then visualize. So we must have a hyperplane. We have to use a hyperplane to separate the data. If it is a two-dimensional, this thing, line, line is simply a two-dimension, it is a one-dimensional hyperplane. And then um, for three attributes, you got a plane which is a two-dimensional hyperplane, but more than two attributes, three attributes, you have to use a multiple dimensional hyperplane. If there are four attributes, you must find out, must have a three-dimensional hyperplane and n attributes, we must have an n minus one dimensional hyperplane to separate the data. Now, given a set of examples, how, which hyperplane is better? Next, yeah. So all of them give 100% accuracies which is better, 
the answer to the question is come down what svm does is svm finds out a hyperplane which maximally separates the data into two different groups meaning it maximizes the margin margin is nothing but the distance between the closest examples belonging to two different classes we can have different lines a line which separates data but that the distance between different classes is less so when the distance is maximize the margin is maximize then that is we can make some allowance for error that's because we have multiple genomes and large number of sequences are available but the annotated sequences for certain functionalities are, are very less so because we are training the data with the less number of examples with not with complete uh, uh, with all the known functionalities are because we don't have experimental annotation the number of examples or number of sequences are less with which we are training a data so we should try to separate the data as much as maximally as possible so that if you make some mistakes there is some allowance for error that's why svm employs a maximal margin hyperplane to separate the data into two different groups yeah next now if uh, a data can be linearly separable then you can use linear hyperplanes but if it is not linearly separable we cannot use linear hyperplanes like chessboard is an example right go back chessboard is an example where you cannot draw a line to separate the data, the black and white squares similarly in the right hand side if we're the red examples are have one class of protein functionality and the blue classes blue examples have another class of functionality you have to identify the surface this quadratic surface to separate the data now as i told you it's possible to visualize this two dimensional or three dimensional data but if you got multiple dimensions if you got thousands of expression expression profiles are available for gene genes and you want to identify whether a person is having cancer or not you cannot draw uh, such a line with uh, multiple genes so you cannot visualize at all so what it means is you cannot use an algorithm which tries to find the surface a nonlinear surface which separates the data into two different groups so there must be different methodologies like kenner's neighbor also doesn't require the surface it uses the similarity between the examples so nearest neighbors the similarity principles to identify the class labels what svm does in in these sort of examples are non linearly separable examples what svm does is an ingenious method go to the next slide yeah actually it takes the data to a higher dimensional space and then uses a linear hyperplane although this the the figure doesn't exactly do what i say it will give you an idea there is a transformation now if people are sleeping like this and you are asked to identify people whose height is more than 5 feet and 10 inches it's not possible whereas you in this right hand this thing if they are standing then it's possible so that's a transformation so it's a geometric transformation so in this the right hand side you can draw a imaginary line to separate people into so they are linearly separable now like that what svm does is it takes the data to a higher dimensional space and then uses a linear hyperplane go to the next so in the original dimension in two dimensions then we cannot use a line to separate the data into two different groups so what svm does is it uses some transformation so that the data can be transformed into three dimensions 
and in three dimensions if the transformation is appropriate then it may be possible to use a linear hyperplane to separate the data into two different groups how do we transform as an example suppose you you have hydrophobicity and charge are x1 and x2 given as 1 and 2 if we use the transformation x1 x1 square x1 x2 and x2 square it becomes 1 and 2 becomes 1 1 into 2 and 4 so 3 and 4 becomes x1 square is 9 x1 x2 is 12 and x2 square is 16 so given a formula for transformation any two dimensional data can be transformed into three dimensional data so we can find a transformation and then if the transformation may or may not separate the data linearly in higher dimensional feature space here we have found it shows a transformation where a, a transformation from two dimensional data to three dimensional data by using some appropriate formula indeed separates the data linearly into two different classes by using a linear hyperplane so this is the principle svm uses but problem here is we have to find out an appropriate transformation now how to find out an appropriate transformation you can go on using formulae after formulae after formulae and then test take it it's not necessary to take the data from two three you can take the data two to four two to five two to six you can take the data into multiple dimensions from input features and then you can try to use a linear hyperplane but it becomes computationally intractable to do this so to avoid this svm employs what are known as kernel functions kernel functions are functions which are defined which which enable us to take the data to higher dimensional attribute space but you can do all the computations in the input space and kernel functions with appropriate kernel parameters can indeed uh, separate the data into two different groups so there are two properties one kernel functions are defined like kernel functions the most frequently used kernel functions are uh, polynomial kernel function uh, radial basis function uh, radial basis uh, kernel function rbf kernel and uh, neural network kernel so like this some a few kernel functions are available with every function every kernel function has got a parameter a kernel parameter with appropriate kernel function if you use an appropriate kernel function with the best possible parameters it may be possible for you to separate the data into two different groups so classification with high accuracy is possible so the pro that is pro property one property one means you can use a few kernel functions and kernel parameters to maximally separate the data into two different groups that is one secondly the kernel functions also enable computations in the original space itself although you take the data into three higher dimensional space what it means is you take the data into three dimensional space to use a linear hyperplane but all the computations can be done in the original input space of hydropathy, hydropathy and charge so this is uh, what svm does now um, if we have time we can talk about the kernel functions uh, a uh, little later uh, so right this is what it is so learning in the future space take it to higher dimensional future space what is not linearly separable in the original space is linearly separable in the higher dimensional future space come down yeah, yeah. so this is what i said we've got two descriptors and if you use the formula x square x y and y square there is a distinct transformation from two dimension to three dimension. So this is how you can map into higher dimensional attribute space. Yeah, next. Come down. Right. 
กำหนดเนี่ยอะไร so why it is known as a p r o d u c t of machines the examples which lie after finding out the best type of lens in the examples which lie close to the your hyperplane on both sides are known as support vector support vectors that's why it is known as a p r o d u c t o machine yeah next yeah next yeah you have talked about multiple kernels so every kernel function has got a parameter the polynomial kernel linear kernel we call as a linear kernel if you don't make a transformation we call that as a linear kernel that means we use the, if there are two attributes and we do not take it to higher dimensional space and then classify then we call it as a linear kernel there is a polynomial kernel polynomial kernel has got uh, multiple parameters a b and d it is d is the degree of the polynomial it can be 1 1.52 it can be decimal also and a and b are the coefficients there are three parameters for the polynomial kernel for the radial basis function kernel that is which can be used as an exponential function uh, and the norm exponential of the norm that means the euclidean distance ex exponential of the euclidean distance between any two uh, protein sequences gives you the uh, the kernel function for uh, for these two examples yeah you can also have a sigmoid kernel now yeah finally there is one additional parameter we have if uh, for example in the left hand side it's 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 all classified with 100% accuracy but it's not very good that's because we have a very small margin although it classifies your training examples are experimentally annotated sequences you are able to classify it very well using this when you try to identify the class label of a new query sequence it may not do well that's because the margin is very small now the right hand side this the examples are not disturbed they are as it is what we have done is the line is now changed the hyperplane is now changed the only difference is it now becomes a little wider and then but there is one misclassification so this is although the training accuracy is slightly lower this this is a better uh, set of parameters because we have got a wider margin so that when a new example comes we can have much better confidence of classifying the sequence with a better uh, accuracy so here what we have is a trade off between the accuracy and margin maximization we can't go on increasing the margin so that the accuracy falls down or we can have nor we can have a very narrow margin so that should be a trade off so that trade off can be for that there is one additional parameter which is known as cost so what we have is a set of kernel functions kernel parameters and a trade off parameters which is known as cost so we have to use this to classify examples when we are going to use a software now yeah next yeah prash is there yeah prashant Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very much, sir. I'm. I'm listening. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Now, uh, should we yeah, go to the Libvisium software? Sir, uh, sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, should sir. Should we go sorry. to Libvisium software? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, yeah. Yes. Let sir. me see whether the Mayur is there. Yeah, because uh, because I'm not able to uh, share due to some problem. Let me talk to him. If he's there, then because he has to be there, he he can do it. Yeah. Hi, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, are you there, Hindi? The... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm joining, but uh, you have to allow me to join. I'll join in two minutes, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Prash is going to join in two minutes. Mayur. Yes, sir. I am not able yes, to sir. share the screen, so you have to explain the libvisium to them. Okay. Yes, sir. 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 Yes,
Okay, then just give me two minutes. You just I will explain, but you have to share. Yeah. Okay, then, then just give yeah. me two minutes and join. So yeah, just yeah. Give me two. Let us uh, till Mayur joins. Let us uh, take questions. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, questions, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, this is Dr. Vipul, sir. Uh, my question is, sir, uh, minimum data set uh, required for training the uh, means this machine. Uh, so, is there any cutoff for any n means number of uh, training data set, uh, or any cutoff we require for any particular uh, model, or it is uh, as much as maximum data is uh, good, or any cutoff is set or uh, anything related to that? See, the more the data, the merrier. The machine learning algorithms works well with larger amount of data. Now, in in some cases, you don't have. In gene expression profiles, you have large number of gene expression profiles, but number of uh, patients are less. So, the the number of so the examples are less, instances are less, but expression profiles are large. But as I told, we cannot have a cutoff. So what we are, you must have a large number of sequences. If you are having smaller sequences, the accuracy itself may not be very good. And if the accuracy is also good, there is no guarantee that it will work well with new uh, sequences. Yeah. We cannot say that is. It all depends upon the different domains. In protein sequences, at least you must have about 300 to 400 sequences. Yeah, then it is uh, a fairly okay number of uh, data set. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. So it may be it around. It may be around means hundred. It is a range. It means. If it is in hundreds yes, or in thousands, there are publications with 50. 60 sequences also, but uh, yeah, see, publishing is something, but trying to uh, uh, get a good uh, algorithm for uh, your data is something else, yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Sir, I'm Manav. Sir, I wanted to know, yeah. like, if, uh, like, say, in some other country, like the Western country, someone has developed some algorithm. So, can we use that algorithm in our setting? Because the data sets will be different. Or, like, do we need to develop our own algorithm? See, the machine learning algorithms which are used are standard. It is, it is not even domain dependent. So you can use uh, support vector machines in bioinformatics. You can use that in chemical engineering. You can use that in in uh, chemoinformatics. You can use that in mechanical engineering. So the algorithms uh, uh, developed uh, are uh, generic. So you can put it to use in different uh, these things. Can you? Uh, I'm not able to understand why do you say this. Uh, sir, like, say, sir, like, uh, like, I come from a medical background. Uh, so, if uh, someone has developed, like, say, for to for the uh, classification of the radiological images, some machine learning algorithm, someone has developed, because the data set uh, for it uh, right. is different. And now, if I want to develop in my setting using the same algorithm, like, will it be validated or like I don't understand? Like, if we are using the different data sets. Yeah, so if you use the same model, it may or may not work. So, using a model algorithm is safe. You can use a support of machines, but mm -hmm. the parameters they have used to uh, optimize their model may not work uh, in uh, Indian conditions. For example, in for certain genomes, uh, the functionalities are identified using only those genomes. It may not work for other genomes also. So that means uh, you may need to retrain the data and get the optimal parameters for your conditions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you,
there is no guarantee that it may work. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Have, I, have I answered your question? Yes, sir. Definitely. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Mayur, uh, can you share the screen? Yeah. Yes, I will share the screen. Yeah. Prash, I will send uh, Libbasvium uh, uh, this thing. I've, um, I have a, uh, this thing, a um, small uh, document which, which they can use sure, after, sir. Sure, after sir. we go. Okay. Yeah. Sure, sir. Yeah, let Mayur uh, start sharing. Yes, sir. Just wait a minute, I'm just taking a call, yeah. Yes, uh, Mayur, go to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. Mayur? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go to the next slide. Yeah. Yeah, he's also having problems, I think. Yeah. Mayur? Hello. Yeah, I yeah yeah. One second, sir. Just give me one second. I was kicked out of yeah. yeah. Yes, sir.
mayor can you open it can you open the uh, run yeah i shared it i shared it so i shared it no no this is okay you can uh, start running it we can show this later yeah you can start showing the command okay. this thing okay. yeah okay okay yeah So should we tell them right to download from us straight away? We should go for no, the best. No, no, directly you can directly go to the command prompt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I have explained how we, we for lack of time, I will not go into that. So we have uh, downloaded the LibreSwim software. and then we are in the windows folder of it so in the, go to the so download the libsvm software and go to the windows folder and then use the command prompt okay right we have the data sets uh, duke training as well as validation validation that is data set let us explain what is the svm just say svm uh, uh, train not dx yes. yeah right so so the svm train dot csv um, uh, exe gives you the types minus s gives you the svm software types so we will we will use only the software zero so we will give minus s zero so we are going to use only that software there are other softwares are available for other different tasks which i have not taught you so currently let us take minus s as zero The T prompt gives you the kernel type. Zero is a linear kernel. The linear kernel means we do not, we are not taking it to higher dimensional attribute space. We are just using a linear hyperplane in the original space. T equal to one means polynomial kernel. So the polynomial kernel has got three parameters: gamma, coefficient zero, and degree. So the gamma is denoted by minus g. Uh, can you show the arrow there, uh, my Mayur? Arrow, arrow, Mayur. Go to minus g. Down, down. Minus g, g, g. Yeah, minus g gamma. Yeah. So then coefficient zero is denoted by minus r, and then degree is denoted by minus d, d, d. Yeah. Okay. There, these are the parameters. now for every kernel we'll use a cost excepting linear kernel the cost is something i talked about the trade off for mag- margin maximization and misclassification right we will use that is the polynomial kernel the radial basis function kernel has got one parameter gamma so my, that is denoted by g but every kernel is told you excepting linear kernel we'll have a parameter c so with this setup let us now try to so uh we have to use a cross validation methodology so to use a cross validation methodology uh the training the training set with the training set we use a cross validation the cross validation gives you a statistically much uh better uh, model than by not using it let me explain a three fold cross validation the three fold cross validation what we do is we build three different models first time we use first and what we do is we randomly divide the data into three different uh, folds in three parts first time we use first two parts model it and then test it with the third part second time we model it second and third and test with the first third we model with the first and third part and test with the second so three different models and then we test and then get the average accuracy that is known as three fold cross validation accuracy normally people use five fold cross validation accuracy so our 10 fold cross validation accuracy i will show you a five fold or 10 fold here so the cross validation methodology is done with the training set so first to use a cross validation methodology to identify the best kernel and best kernel parameters 
So let us try to use a linear kernel first. Yeah, use a linear kernel, uh, Mayur. Yeah. SVM train. Yeah. Train, train. Ah, yeah. So we will use minus S zero. Minus S, minus S. Mayur, start with minus S. Mayur. Ah, okay. Now minus T zero is the linear kernel. You just see up minus T zero is the linear kernel. Yeah. Yeah. Next. Then for linear kernel, we don't we need not have any parameters because we are classifying in the original space, so there is no need to use any other parameters. So minus T is zero. Minus T is zero. Then now let us use a tenfold cross validation. So that means the training set, we are, we are 10 times we are uh, doing a model and then taking the average. That will be the tenfold cross validation accuracy. Yeah, minus with 10. Yeah. Use minus with 10, Mayur. Yeah, minus with 10. 10. I am not able to see that. Yeah. Yeah, minus with 10. Then. That's all. Now we will connect the data set to this. Yeah. Yeah, the data set. So what we have done is we have used a linear kernel and then we have used tenfold cross validation. Ten times it does and then finally it finds out the accuracy. Where is that? Yeah. Where is the CV accuracy? Come down. It is so it has given you an, an accuracy of 89.47%. Now let us use a polynomial kernel. Yeah. So uh, you just uh, uh, clear clear everything and then use the okay, right? Okay. Minus s zero t. Yeah. yeah. So minus s zero. Now we'll use minus t as one, so polynomial kernel. So we have to use three parameters, gamma. So that is minus d, minus g, and minus r. We have to specify three parameters. Okay. So minus t is one, minus d is two. We'll use a second degree polynomial, minus d is two. Then we'll use uh, um, minus g as one and minus r as uh, 0.5. Yeah. Right. So we are using polynomial kernel that is denoted by t equal to one, second degree polynomial, and the two other parameters of the kernel are g and r. Okay. And we are using a tenfold cross validation. Run it. So it gives you 60% accuracy. Let us try to change the parameters of this kernel. Yeah. Go back and slightly change the parameters. Yeah. Put minus d equal to 3, see what happens. Yeah. Run. It, it has increased a little more. Let us change another parameter. Yeah. yeah. Put uh, g is uh, 2. Run. So it's not changing. It's uh, similar. Okay. So like this, every kernel. So I have not used the cost parameter. Let us add the cost parameter. Come down. Yeah. Go back. Put minus C as 10. Yeah. Minus C as the, this cost parameter gives you a trade off between margin maximization and misclassification. An appropriate margin, the best trade off between the margin size and the uh, best training accuracy this particular uh, uh, parameter will give. So run it, run that will now, yeah. So this is not changing much because uh, this is insensitive, insensitive to other parameters, okay. Let us now go to the third kernel, 
the radial basis function kernel. So again, you just uh, you just clear and then show that again we'll see clear. Yeah. Mayur? Yes, sir. Yes, it's happening. One second. Yeah. You just clear so that let us see the parameters again, no? CLS, yeah. Mm. Yeah, right. So, let us put T as 2. It will now use radial basis function as a kernel. And there is only one parameter gamma, but we have to use C as another parameter. So let us go to this. Yeah. Yeah. Minus S0, minus T2, minus G10, 10, minus C10, minus V10. So, what we are using is t equal to 2 denotes the radial basis function kernel. g is the parameter of that kernel. c is the trade off parameter. We are using a tenfold cross validation accuracy. Yeah, run it. Yeah. Run, run. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, it's a bad accuracy. It's 57.89. It is 51.89. So, which is uh, not very good. Let us try to change the parameter and see whether it increases. Yeah. Put uh, G is 1. 1, 1. Yeah. Run. No. 0. 0.1. 0. 0.1. G is 0. CS 100, go back with CS 100, C. Are you? Yes, sir, it's coming same only. When C is equal to 100 also, it is coming as 57. No, oh, it's also 57. Okay, right. Okay. So, it's not changing. So, what we have not done is, we have used different kernels and different kernel parameters. So, this is an example which shows, it's, we, it's not, it is a linearly separable data. And if you are using nonlinear kernels, it is not, it is not going to help you better. So, the linear kernel is giving about 89%, which is much better. So, after trying with various set of parameters, so we finally found out the linear kernel is good. Now, in tenfold cross validation, what we do is every time we use one fold as test, that means the algorithm sees only, if we have 100 examples, the algorithm always sees only 90 examples 10 different times and averages it. But once we have ascertained that the linear kernel is the best, or we have found out the optimal set of parameters, we now have to build a final model with all the examples. As we told, the more the merrier. So once the CV is used to identify the optimal set of parameters, once we have identified the optimal set of parameters, we now have to build a final model with all the examples, that means we are not using a cross validation because we have already identified that linear kernel is the best. So we will use all the examples to do that in this software. Just we have to remove that minus V10. Yeah. Okay. And use T equal to zero. Yeah. Remove the minus V10. Yeah. And you just run it. Yeah. So it gives some certain statistics, number of support vectors are 34 and other things. Uh, that's not necessary for you. Yeah. Now, go back to the Windows folder and show a model has been built. Yeah. 
highlight it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we have a model here which has now come. Now, this model will be used to test the validation data. So let us do how to let us try how to do it. Yeah. Mayur, you will now predict. So with the built model, we will predict the class labels of new unseen data. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, 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 no. Duke dot, yeah, train, correct. No, this is not train. Duke dot, uh, no, validation, yeah. So connect the validation test data, then the model, and then you just, and then you just, yeah, this is the model, and then you just create your own data, output data, duke dot out, which will give you the class labels of each of the examples. Now run it, yeah. So the accuracy of the test set is 75%. Now, if you go to the Duke dot out, no, for every example, it will give you the class labels, the predictions. Yeah, go to the Duke dot out. Go to the folder and open that, Mayur. So a Duke dot out is created and yeah. Yeah, the output file is created, zip dot out. Output? Uh, so output it, file called zip dot out will be created. It's created, but can you uh, can you show that file? Yeah. So there are only four examples. I think the four examples, the first three examples are minus one and fourth example is class level one. You can either use one and zero or one and minus one. So the, so the entire this thing again, uh, Mayur, you can show from the slides what we are doing. Yeah. So first, uh, this is the site where we have to download the test games from. Uh, we get versions for uh, Windows, Mac, as well as Ubuntu over here. Then we download the Duke dataset uh, from the given uh, URL. Uh, it is uh, having a compression of .bz2. So the TR is the training dataset and VL is the validation dataset. So next, what we have to do is we have to shift uh, both of them inside the libsvm folder that we compress out first. So for Windows users, you have to go to the Windows uh, folder and unzip the duke.tr and duke.val inside this folder. So now what we have to do is we have to go inside Windows folder and open the command prompt, the cmd. You can, uh, so Windows 11 users, you can either right click on the folder and just over there you will get an option of open terminal here. Or a longer way to do it is that you can start and type CMD and then paste the path that we have given over here. Uh, your path will look similar to mine, uh, something like the users, maybe your name, downloads for the folder where you downloaded libsvm, and then the Windows path. So once you open up, your prompt will look something like this with the path to the Windows folder. Can you ask one question? Yeah, yeah please. Uh, no need to uh, go for uh, program files directly if you have installed in uh, downloads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, it is a complex one. You don't have to do any kind of dot executable file is already provided. So you don't have to go to program files and install it separately. Okay. If you're using Windows, then the dot exe is already provided to you. So you just straight away open it. You don't have to go to program files to install it. So now once you do that, uh, you open the libsvm folder over here and if you try type svm-train.exe, 
So like we showed usages, different options and different parameters you get for the SVM type, the kernel type, and like Sir explained, the degree, the gamma values, coefficient, cost, all of them. So all these parameters are uh, stable and you can experiment on your own. So over here, we took the Duke model, uh, Duke uh, training dataset example, and we trained our SVM model. So this is the command that we typed for that, svm-train.exe, like Sir said, uh, minus S0 for the type of SVM, minus T0 indicates a linear kernel, and duke.tr. So T is equal to 0 is linear kernel, V is equal to 10 means we are doing a 10-fold cross-validation over here. And after running, we get a CV accuracy of approximately 89% over there. Okay, so a uh, question is being asked that uh, how we convert data to binaries. Well, the data set uh, over here, we don't have to explicitly convert it. Uh, we just use the data uh, .tr folder uh, file as provided. And you won't have to uh, explicitly convert it into binaries. It is uh, uh, you know, modified for the usage over here straight away. So once you do that, uh, you get a CV accuracy of approximately 89%. Now, like we experimented with different kernels over here, say for example, if we need to use a RBF kernel, the command changes so that the minus P value goes to two, and then we give a gamma value of minus G as one, and the cost factor as 10. But uh, over here it is observed that accuracy kind of drops drastically to 57%. Same with the polynomial kernel, if you want to use, you have to change minus t value to 1. And the degree of polynomial is indicated with the parameter minus b, while the first coefficient of the parameter uh, of the equation is governed by the uh, value parameter of minus r. Again, we are giving a tenfold cross validation here. And as you can see, that we obtain a CV accuracy of 86% over here. So based on different parameter values and different kernel values, you are free to experiment and check out different values that you're getting on the training data set. So with these parameters, we build our model. And then what we do is we test our duke.val file. So as we, uh, as we mentioned over here, we selected the validation, folder, uh, validation model for the linear model because it was giving us the maximum accuracy. So again, we train our model on a linear kernel. So once we do that, a file will be created inside Windows or Ubuntu or Mac or whatever platform we are using, the file called duke.tr.module. So this is the model param parameters which you need for validation in the next stage. Now, if you want to use this model for validation, you have to use svmpredict.exe and duke.val. Once you do use duke.val, what you have to give is uh, the model file that is created, that is duke.tr.model, and then separate output file, duke.out. So based on this, it will write all the uh, predictions that the model thinks are correct in the duke.out folder. So as you can see, we got an approximate accuracy of 75% over here. Now, same thing, we are repeating with a polynomial kernel. Again, we are giving the command, and we are using it to run the SVM predict.exe. And over there also, we are getting an approximate accuracy of 75%. So as we saw, the linear kernel is actually providing the best, best accuracy over here for cross-validation and also for the test, uh, test also. So we have used linear kernel as our final model. So the duke.tr.model is a linear kernel. Uh, any questions? The Libesvium. Uh, site has got large number of models. Can you show that Libesium site? Sure, yeah, I'll return the site and show it. One second. You just open the, the so site. This is, so this is the data set. No, no, go back. Okay, okay, okay. so data set is uh, data set looks like something like this. Yeah, yeah. There are large amount of data sets. There are diabetes. There are many data sets which are important for uh, bioinformatics and chemoinformatics. You can try with these data sets also. So we'll be sending this to you. Um, uh, I will send it to Prash, and then Prash will send it to you all. And uh, we will 
as i said now we'll have one more session later and we can now we have python uh, tutorial also if, uh, if we have uh, one more slot available later yeah thanks a lot if you have any questions please ask me i'm sorry that uh, in the beginning i couldn't uh, uh, open my this thing i can share yeah i'm really sorry about it we lost some time on that so i wanted to explain two more algorithms at least Thank you. Please, I'll take questions. Sir, this is an amazing lecture, actually. Uh, always be like to learn from you. And like, uh, if you are having two more, we are um, more than four. We are ready to learn from you, sir. So, like, um, this this session was very good. But something something is uh, not clear to us because we are not doing it uh, right uh, at present. So we will try this, and then if we are having questions, then we will get back to you. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, sir. I think uh, it is difficult to understand everything in one go. I have never understood anything in in a given lecture. So, so that is understandable. And if you have any queries, please ask me. Uh, we'll be very happy to answer. Yeah. <laughs> So what exactly the kernel is like? I have understood what we have done, but what do we mean by kernel here? Yeah, I'll tell you. See, the support vector machines. The theory is a little rigorous. So SVM essentially converts. If, see, if a multiple dimensional problem into a one dimensional problem by using the dot products between these examples. So. We have is a dot product. So the dot product. So so we have a set of dot products. Every example to every other example, we have got a dot product. Suppose I got an example. I have got one example in which I have got attribute one is five, attribute two is seven, five and seven. Second example six and eight. The dot product is five into six plus seven into eight. So the two dimensional data now is converted to one dimensional data so svm converts the data into multiple dimensional data into one dimension by using a dot product now your algorithm formulae now results in terms of a dot product now the dot product now is in two dimension if you are using a two dimension and you getting a dot product and using the dot product and try to get the hyperplane you are not able to you get a separation because it is not linearly separable. For that, we convert the data into higher dimension. When you are converting data into higher dimension, suppose two to three dimension, the dot product now will have three attributes: five, seven, and eight. Six, seven, and six, eight, and nine. So you have to multiply five into six plus seven into eight plus nine into something like that. So again, whether it is two dimension or three dimension, the dot product is one dimension, but the dot product is different. Now, in the original dimension. The dot products are similar. The dot products are similarities. The similarities are not providing a linear separation, but in a higher dimensional attribute space, it may provide a linear separation. Now, the kernel function defines the dot product in a higher dimension in terms of the original dimension. What it means is, if you can find a function which is able to get, to get the dot product in higher dimension. In terms of the original dimension, that function is useful because you need not go to high dimension and do the computation. You can do the computations in the input space itself. So it's a rigorous theory. Now these, so there are certain axioms for a function to be a kernel function. It has to satisfy the Hilbert space and it has to be positive definite. So these are some mathematical uh, rigors which uh, it requires a little more of. Uh, uh, Theory to understand that, yeah. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, you know um, uh, we all should uh, uh, thank uh, Jaraman sir and uh, uh, Mayur Panda, uh, uh, you know, for his uh, you know for their you know, wonderful uh, talk. And uh, it's always you know, uh, a joy hearing uh, Jeremy, sir.
always a kind of a learning experience this is my at least i would say umpteenth time uh, listening to jeremy sir and every time you know i uh, i i learn i learn something exciting and new so uh, friends you know uh, i hope you all will agree uh, uh, let's uh, give a something or a applause to jeremy sir and uh, my resh ke yeah. yeah so uh, thank you so much jeremy sir uh for this uh, gracious time uh, uh, uh and uh, yasmin and uh, others i think you know it's always uh, sir not audible sir 